All right, this video is uh, the uh, beginning part of therapy. So this is modules 53 through 55. Um, so far, we have looked at uh, different types of therapy um, in your therapy comparisons chart. Um, we looked at some examples of therapy. Um, so this uh, video is basically kind of bringing it all together, um, essentially. And so um, it's mostly focusing on uh, information from module 54. Uh, so first of all, um, Psychotherapy. Um, we have to define exactly what psychotherapy is. So psychotherapy is uh, basically this idea, it's kind of this what some people call talk therapy. Um, it's this idea where you have this trained therapist that's using some sort of psychological techniques to help somebody overcome a psychological problem. Um, so um, all the psychotherapies that we've talked about so far have included psychoanalysis, uh, humanistic perspective, cognitivism, behavioralism, um, group therapy, all of those are psychotherapies. Um, the biomedical therapies, on the other hand, um, the others that are on your therapy comparison chart um, would include, for example, um, drug therapies, brain stimulation, and psychosurgery. So those are different because they treat um, psychological problems as also physical problems. Okay. Now, what I want you to understand is, is that most therapists don't don't use just one particular approach. The you you talk to any psychologist or psychiatrist today, they're not going to tell you, oh yeah, I'm a humanistic therapist, or yes, I'm a cognitive therapist. They most of them use this eclectic approach, and they. Um, most of them use um, therapy uh, involving many different types of therapy. And so they kind of take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, even my sister-in-law, um, who has been involved in psychology in a lot of different ways, um, I showed her some of the different types of therapies that are in our book. And um, she, you know, freely admits it. She's just like, well, the, she's like, I practice client-centered therapy, you know, I, I show empathy to my clients, but at the same point in time, she's just like, I also practice behavioralism or um, cognitivism. Um, so there's, you know, you, you use a lot of different things. Um, I do have a couple of um, cartoons kind of illustrate each type of therapy. Uh, so this one is showing you what if, you know, you're constantly saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. And the therapist is training you to say, I can. This type of therapy would be cognitive therapy because you're training them to think differently, right? Uh, what about this one? It says, you know, a large spider five meters away doesn't seem so bad at all anymore. And, you know, he's he's kind of farther away, close closer to the door, and here's the spiders, and obviously there's a bigger spider coming in. So what type of therapy is that? Systematic desensitization. What about this one? It says, uh, obviously, Humpty Dumpty's in uh, therapy here. And the therapist says, eventually, I'd like you to see you be able to put yourself back together. Um, type of therapy that one would be? That one would be humanistic because he's trying to get him to do it himself. You know, humanism is all about empowering them to do it themselves. What about this one? It says there's the therapist. He's got a cigarette on a mouse trap, And he offers the guy, says, smoke. That would be aversive therapy because obviously he gets a negative consequence for choosing that. Um, this one, it says, this guy is saying, I didn't mean that. He didn't. He said something. He didn't mean that. And this little little guy in the little voice inside his head says, but I did. Did I mean that? Oh, but I did. So your subconscious, this would be psychoanalytic, psychoanalysis. This one says what you think, what you do, and how you feel. They're all interconnected. So trying to change what you think, and so as a result, how you behave, and how you feel, and so as a result, how you feel. So this would be cognitive behavioralism, because you're changing how you think, and as a result, how you behave, and so then hopefully you feel better. This one, the last one says, uh, obviously it's the Grim Reaper and he's in psychotherapy and he says, it feels like people are always trying to avoid me. Now this one's a little tough to be honest, um, but this one is uh, kind of a general theme or trend. Every, everyone in the past and currently is trying to avoid me. Um, you could potentially argue and my intention was like psychodynamic because um, psychodynamic is looking at past behaviors and themes and trends from past behaviors and current behaviors, the relationships, take it for what you will. 
Okay, so evaluating psychotherapies. How do you evaluate psychotherapies? First of all, the effectiveness of each type. Um, it's kind of hard to uh, determine the effectiveness of each type because um, problems uh, the clients have, uh, a lot of them will eventually get better on their own. Um, especially, for example, um, mood disorders, depression. Um, they'll, they'll get better on their own eventually over time. Um, schizophrenics do not get better on their own, um, but they will find coping mechanisms. Um, so, you know, they, a lot of people find some sort of coping mechanism to kind of get through the day. Um, so it's kind of hard to be able to say, yeah, they're, they're better because of the therapy. Well, maybe it was just because time passed and they figured it out on their own. Um, so eventually people will be better. Um, but uh, there's also this idea of this regression towards the mean um, that also illustrates that people do get it better on their own. They eventually will regress to whatever their average state originally was. Um, this applies to emotions, but it also applies to a lot of other things. For example, if you're talking about if you've ever had a class where maybe you overall you know, maybe you got C's generally when you're taking quizzes and tests or C's on this in this um, particular class. And then you had like one quiz or test where all of a sudden, oh my gosh, I got an A. Wow, maybe I'm getting it. Maybe I did something different and I studied differently and I, I did really well. And then you took the next quiz or test and you went back to a C. <laughs> so that's the idea of regression towards the mean. You're always going to be this tendency to kind of return to the average state. Uh, another example of this would be um, New Year's resolutions. Every year, New Year's resolutions come up. If you, you know, the most popular resolution is to, you know, lose weight or exercise more. Um, I found this cartoon. I thought this was funny. It says, "I'm opening a gym called Resolutions, and we'll have exercise equipment for the first two weeks, and then uh, turn into a bar for the rest of the year." Uh, this is a great example of a regression towards the mean because that's what people do. They get really, you know. Um, aggressive about their resolution in the first couple of weeks and then they regress back to what their normal tendencies were. That's regression towards the mean. Now, um, other things to consider when um, evaluating the effectiveness of each type. Um, clients in therapy do generally get better and they do are more likely to improve than somebody who isn't in therapy. So even though I said, you know, yes, you, are, you will generally get better over time anyways or you'll find a coping mechanism, but you'll be better um, your coping mechanism or you'll get uh, more likely to improve and faster if you're in therapy. Um, so I like this cartoon. It says, as I become less and less nuts, will you lower your fee accordingly? Unfortunately, no, but <laughs> I thought that was kind of cute. Uh, no one therapy overall, though, is best, um, but uh, some do better at particular disorders than others. Uh, for example, aversive, um, adversive conditioning is best with, for example, um, addiction disorders. Uh, if you want to talk about systematic desensitization, those work best with, um, you know, phobias, for example, and, uh, so, or uh, PTSD, for example. So some therapies are better for particular disorders, but it doesn't mean that they're better overall. It's just they, they're a better fit. Um, this is an example of um, systematic desensitization, particularly using virtual reality. Um, this has been used um, particularly for PTSD um, patients. Um, this guy um, was a war veteran and he had PTSD. Uh, so the, in therapy, this is kind of like the end of the d systematic desensitization. But in the beginning, you would just imagine being, um, for example, back in Iraq or wherever that he, the PTSD occurred and um, progressively get to the point where they're in the virtual reality and they actually pushed him in the situation that caused the PTSD. So then he can deal with that anxiety that's caused it. Um, so again, you know, there are some that are, work better than others. Uh, there is um, also evidence-based practice. Uh, evidence-based practice is encouraged with therapy. Um, this is the idea that um, treatment is actually based off from not only um, what's best for the client, and so the, each individual client, what they have going on, but also the individual therapist's experience, and so um, what they have used successfully in the past, as well as best available research. Um, so uh, talking to my sister-in-law, she talks about this all the time and saying that um, that's kind of a buzz 
phrase um, in the industry, evidence-based practice, um, uh, where uh, you are trying to incorporate what you know research shows as well as you know what your experience shows and what your parent, patient actually needs. Oh, I forgot to animate. Uh, culture and therapy. So culture and therapy, um, the, it is important that therapists be sensitive to uh, their client's culture and their religion uh, because obviously you may have um, a clash. For example, if you're a, in uh, therapy with, for example, a therapist um, that is a Western culture and this lady maybe is a Western culture and she's going to shake this guy's hand and he is maybe from an Eastern culture where, you know, it is not appropriate to do that, um, especially with a female, for example, and he's bowing to show respect. It's very important that they recognize um, the differences. Um, most therapists nowadays are very well trained in different cultures to be prepared for that um, possibility. Um, but should therapists share what their personal beliefs are before starting therapy? Is that, what do you think? Is that um, important? Um, for example, what about, um, you know, marriage? Um, do they think that, um, does the therapist, for example, think that um, it's important to be married um, before you have sexual relations with someone? Um, that could be important when you're in therapy, for example, um, and one of your signs and symptoms is that you are, uh, have many sexual partners, okay? Well, you know, if your therapist believes that this is wrong, inherently wrong, that will change the way they approach therapy with you. So, you know, some people argue that that is something that therapists need to do is they need to share their personal beliefs with their client and say, okay, this is what I personally believe in my, um, you know, culture and religion is what I, I believe in going forward so that you know that. Um, so that, uh, you know, you can know um, what you're getting into, basically. Uh, the last little bit that I wanted to briefly mention would be um, preventing disorders. Um, so there is, uh, there are some um, psychologists that look at trying to prevent disorders, trying to um, do a lot of proactive things to try and um, make sure that it um, is less likely to happen. Um, uh, they do um, things like trying to provide healthy environments uh, for people, uh, including communication training, um, support for stressed families. Um, these are my pictures that were not animated at the bottom. Uh, but for example, the one on the left, um, where it's trying to illustrate uh, a family that maybe had a fa has a family member um, that's in the Navy, that has the, on this aircraft carrier or on the um, battleship here, um, and trying to provide support for that family um, as they go through this time where it's probably very stressful for them. You know, they don't, they're not able to easily communicate with that family member. Um, and, uh, you know, what if, for example, something happened where um, they did unfortunately die? Um, you know, what kind of support does the military offer them? So trying to prevent those disorders, trying to prevent depression, as well as my picture on the right here um, of a very stressed out mom who probably um, is, um, has a new born here um, and potentially could develop postpartum depression um, where you develop depression after the birth of a baby and it's part of it is having to do with hormones but I um, mean your hormones levels changed quite a bit right after giving birth um, but you know, trying to make sure that she has enough support so that she doesn't slip even further. Um, and, um, you know, my personal experience, um, they, uh, you know, my doctors were always very supportive and asking, you know, right after, you know, baby's born, you know, and asking, okay, how are you feeling? How are you doing? You know, you know, do you, are you interacting with other people? Are you interacting with your baby? Those kinds of things to ensure that, you know, they're, they're not in this, this bad negative place. All right, that's it. That's all I wanted to talk about as far as therapy is concerned. Please let me know if you have any questions.